Um, again, I know I just mentioned it, but I want to push for everyone to think about coming to retreat. Really excited for that. Um, today we are continuing our series on Daniel. And actually, next week will be the last part already for this series. Not the end of the book, but the last part of our series. Um, So it's been a very interesting series just to learn about um, Daniel in these times of of exile. So I just kind of wanted to do um, like a visual recap. I don't know why, but I just really like to look up images of the past couple chapters. Maybe it'll help us remember what we've talked about the past couple of weeks. So... Um, This first one here, Daniel 1, was about Daniel um, as a young man being raised up in in the royal service or being recruited. Um, They were looking for all the healthy, strong young men with his friends, and they didn't want to, um, he didn't want to violate the Jewish um, food laws because they were going to give them foods that they couldn't eat, and so um, he didn't want to do that, and so he asked them to test them with veg- vegetables and water for 10 days. I don't know if this is ringing a, b- ringing a bell for people. I talked about this a few weeks ago. And after the 10 days, um, they were looking healthier and more nourished than the other Babylonian men. And so from there, we kind of like see how Daniel and his friends move up in the royal service and um, serve the Babylonian empire in that way. And then for Daniel 2, we have this image here of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. So King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, and all of his wise men could not interpret it. Um, And then he wanted to um, kill all the wise men and do that. Um, But Daniel heard about it, and he didn't want to die, obviously. So he really prayed to God um, to help him interpret this dream. And then God gave him that vision of what it meant. And there's this statue here representing different kingdoms, and um, how Nebuchadne- after Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, there would be a few more, and then um, they would all crumble, and God would form his kingdom um, in the image of a mountain. So I'm summarizing this myself, um, but you can feel free to read it. Um, probably, hopefully not getting some of the facts wrong. But in Daniel 3, we had the um, blazing furnace. So we had the three friends that didn't want to bow down to this huge statue that Nebuchadnezzar had um, <clears throat> built up that he wanted everyone to worship. And so they were thrown into the fire, and then nothing happened to them because God was protecting them, and they could see a fourth one in the fire, which represents Christ um, saving them from harm in the fire. And then for Daniel 4, um, Nebuchadnezzar had another dream where he was a tree, and that tree was struck down, and the stump was left in the field with animals living nearby. And so Daniel, again, his wise men could not interpret, but Daniel comes to interpret, and he renounces, um, um, he asks Nebuchadnezzar to renounce your sin, turn to God. And then eventually uh, Nebuchadnezzar is looking like, all these, look at all the things that I've accomplished. Look at this kingdom in front of me. And then the dream comes true, and God takes away his kingdom, and he becomes this beast or this animal in the field until he acknowledges that God is the ruler over all kingdoms. And once he did, his kingdom was restored, and he turned to God, and he worshiped God. So that's a summary of the first four chapters of Daniel where we've um, been. And today we talk about another king of Babylon, and we see what happens when he does not humble himself before God, and how God will use Daniel once again to show the Babylonian people who he is. And so this chapter is often known as the writing on the wall. And generally when we hear this phrase, the writing on the wall, it's an idiom, right? Um, That comes from this story. So when we say the writing is on the wall, we mean that there are clear signs that something unpleasant or unwelcome is gonna happen. Something's gonna go wrong and you can tell. The writing is on the wall. Like you can see maybe your company is losing a lot of money and you might not be able to keep your job. You can see that the writing is on the wall and you begin to look for a new job. Or maybe when the pandemic started, somebody could see the writing on the wall and then they decided to cancel their travel plans. Um, it's essentially the forewarning or foreshadowing of something happening that is not good. And this is a well-known idiom that's used by many people and it came from this chapter in the Bible in Daniel 5. So we're not going to read through the whole chapter right now, but we're going to go through it um, like we've been doing um, in chunks just because it's so long and unpack the passage that way. Um, So you can have your Bibles open to Daniel 5, and uh, we're just going to pray before we start. Uh, Lord God, we just welcome you into this room right now, God. Uh, May your presence just 
uh, fill this room. And Holy Spirit, would you speak to us today? Would you encourage us? Would you challenge us? Uh, would you convict us? And would you comfort us with your word? And may we hear that specific word or lesson that you have for us today, God, from Daniel 5. All this we pray in your name. Amen. So we start here with King Belshazzar, and I'm going to read this first part, and we're going to start the story here. So King Belshazzar gave a great banquet for a thousand of his nobles and drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking his wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and silver goblets that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, so that the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, might drink from them. So they brought in the gold goblets that had been taken from the temple of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives and his concubines, drank from them. As they drank the wine, they praised the gods of gold and silver, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone. So at this time, you have King Belshazzar and his people, his nobles, his officials, and they're actually celebrating a festival here that honored the moon god. And then we hear about these other gods that they're praising here made out of um, gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. And what historians say was happening at the time, or scholars, was that there was an army besieging Babylon or surrounding it to capture the empire. This was already happening. And they knew of this feast and presumed that the king and all the nobles would be caught off guard, so they would take the opportunity to attack the city. So we have this image here of a great banquet. Um, I have a picture up here of a thousand people um, the king's officials, and drinking and having a party on the eve of this festival. And we have King Belshazzar, who's an ancestor of Nebuchadnezzar. Um, the text here says son, and some scholars say son, others say grandson. I'm going to go with grandson. Um, or He's just an ancestor um, of Nebuchadnezzar. And while they're drinking away, Belshazzar has gold and silver goblets brought in, which were goblets Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple in Jerusalem, when they attacked the city. So when we take a minute to imagine this scene unfolding, um, it's not just a party of people having fun, it's actually a very offensive scene. So Belshazzar brings in the goblets and the people drink from them. They make use of these sacred temple vessels for a night of revelry and drunkenness. And to witness this would have caused shock and outrage for the Jewish people who were in exile in Babylon. Not only are they being held captive in a foreign land, sacred items are being used in the temple of God that were stored away in the palace of Babylon. They're being used now for a party. And it's offensive and incredibly disrespectful to the people and to Yahweh, to God himself, not just to have looted these items and have them in their possession, but for them to use them to praise Babylon's gods was even more sacrilegious. It was an extreme violation or misuse of what is considered sacred. So there's this disregard here by Belshazzar for the Jewish people, and as a pagan king, he set himself up as superior to the Lord. And as they use these cups from the temple of God, they're praising gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, gods made out of materials that God created. So there's this audacity to take the goblets of special significance to the temple of the Lord, drink from them, and praise other gods made out of earthly material. So it's not just a party, but this is incredibly offensive to God. I wonder here, I know we're just getting started with the text, but I wonder here what other gods, lowercase g, might we have in our own lives that hinder us from acknowledging and worshiping God as Lord over everything? Is there an authority, a person, or a thing that we hold in higher regard than God? Somewhere we would turn to and give our dedication and praise to before turning to God. Where does God rank in our hearts and our minds? We're about to see that God will not stand for this attack on his sovereignty and honor and power. He will not be mocked. So we have here in verse 5, Suddenly the fingers of a human hand appeared and wrote on the plaster of the wall near the lampstand in the royal palace. The king watched the hand as it wrote, 
His face turned pale, and he was so frightened that his legs became weak and his knees were knocking. So we have this image here. Um, this one is by uh, Rembrandt. And this hand that appears near the lampstand, suggesting that the writing can be clearly seen because it's front of the, in front of the light, in front of the lamp. It's near the light, and the hand writes. And it's just a hand, no arm, no body. That's, at least it doesn't say in the text, but it's just a hand. And the king's jolly and brightness changes, and he's alarmed. His face turns pale, he's so frightened, his legs become weak, and his knees are knocking. Why is he so afraid? I mean, obviously, it's very surprising and scary and shocking to just see a hand pop up. It seems like a scene from a horror movie. You just need to add that eerie music with this random hand. But how does he know that it's not just a surprise or um, a party trick prepared by one of his astrologers or magicians or wise men? That the hand isn't going to write something that celebrates him as a ruler, as a king. We don't know, but maybe his guilty conscience kicks in here and he's troubled knowing that he did something that offended the God of the Israelites. Is he going to be punished? What did the writing on the wall say? So the king summoned the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners in verse 7. Then he said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever reads this writing and tells me what it means will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around his neck, and he will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king what it meant. So King Belshazzar became even more terrified, and his face grew more pale. His nobles were baffled. He probably didn't just summon this group. Um, he probably called out loudly with strength in fear, desperate to know what the writing on the wall meant. So he promises clothing in purple, which is a color associated with royalty in the ancient world, and a gold chain or collar, something substantial in jewelry. So all of the wise men came, and they could not read the writing or figure it out. And we see this parallel here with the king's men being unable to interpret Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. And the wise men probably couldn't read the writing on the wall, not because it was written in a language or characters they didn't know or recognize, it was written in Aramaic, but maybe because God simply prevented them from being able to understand it. Maybe he put a mist in their eyes, we don't know, or just confused them, so that the interpretation of this mystical writing would be reserved for somebody else, like Daniel. So Daniel is once again brought in years later, and it's the queen, possibly the mother of Belshazzar, the queen mother who brings up his name. In verse 10, it says, the queen, hearing the voices of the king and his nobles, came into the banquet call. May the king live forever, she said. Don't be alarmed. Don't look so pale. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy gods in him. In the time of your father, he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. He did this because Daniel, whom the king called Belteshazzar, was found to have a keen mind and knowledge and understanding, and also the ability to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. And at this point, Daniel is around 80-something years old, and yet he comes to mind because of the impact that he had previously with King Nebuchadnezzar. He was able to interpret the dreams of the king. He had wisdom that came from God, knowledge, understanding beyond all the other wise men. And he was humble, obedient to the Lord, and loyal. And Daniel was summoned separately. For some reason, he did not accompany all the other wise men. Um, Belshazzar did not know Daniel personally. Maybe Daniel had already left the public service by this time. He was here being called at his older age to decipher this mystical writing on the wall. And we see this failure here still, again, by the Babylonians to recognize that the wisdom Daniel has comes from God. They continue to use this phrase, the spirit of the holy gods, lowercase g, is in you. But we also see that when a crisis arises, people can turn to men and women of God for answers. 
because no wisdom is greater than God's wisdom. There's this continued theme here that human wisdom, even the greatest powers, the dark arts, or cannot compare to the wisdom and power and authority of God. We see a repeated demonstration here of this as Daniel's called in to interpret dreams, as he figures out how to navigate life in Babylon as a Jewish exile, and he succeeds in climbing up the ranks in the royal service. And God gave Daniel his wisdom in these situations where it was life or death for some of these situations. And God used Daniel to fulfill his purposes and to make himself known. And this is significant when we realize that we can come to God for wisdom that cannot be compared to when we realize that we need his wisdom to learn how to live, what to do, because our own human wisdom is flawed and insufficient. And as exiles in this world, citizens of a pluralistic world where we are in it but not of it, God can and will use us to demonstrate his power and glory, just like Daniel. And we need to know how valuable we are as his representatives, as his children. God wants us to serve him by serving this world well, despite not belonging to it. To offer ourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, and not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed and different. That comes from Romans 12, 1 to 2. And I've got the message translation here, uh, which I think really explains well how we are to live as exiles. As we think about this um, story in Daniel or the book of Daniel and think about us today as peoples in a foreign land, in a world that is not actually our home. This is not where we will be in the end as followers of Jesus. It says, so here's what I want you to do, God helping you. Take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity. God brings the best out of you, develops well-formed maturity in you. How might we be conforming to the culture that we live in as opposed to fixing our eyes on God? Are we compromising? Are we being apathetic? We don't care. We just come to church and that's it. Where do we need transformation and renewal to happen in us so that we can offer everything before God and serve the world well? As sojourners on this earth, we have a purpose through our lives, our words, our actions, to tell and to show the world who this most high God is and why we worship and praise him. He has purpose for us, and it is worth knowing what that is and living it out like Daniel. God still continues to use him here at, as his witness at the age of 80. Some of us may feel like we don't know how to serve God. We're too busy and exhausted. We don't want to. We just want to be comfortable. We don't know what we're meant to be doing to serve God. But we need to know our worth and influence as children of God in a world of unbelief and also a world where people are searching for something more, people are lonely, people are looking for meaning in life. Pay attention to these opportunities where God might be asking us to demonstrate his love and grace so that others might know who he is. Because part of the kingdom of God lives within us as his representatives, as his children, as his agents and ambassadors on this earth. He's establishing his kingdom with the transformation and renewal of his people. So know your worth and your influence as a child of God. We matter and we have a voice as God's people filled with the Holy Spirit in us. Even when the world says that they don't want to hear about God, they don't want to hear from Christians, we have a voice and we are very valuable as children of God. 
So back to the text. So Daniel was brought before the king, and the king said to him, Are you Daniel, one of the exiles my father the king brought from Judah? I have heard that the spirit of the gods, here we have this phrase again, is in you, and that you have insight, intelligence, and outstanding wisdom. The wise men and enchanters were brought before me to read this writing and tell me what it means, but they could not explain it. Now I have heard that you are able to give interpretations and to solve difficult problems. If you can read this writing and tell me what it means, you will be clothed in purple and have a gold chain placed around your neck and you will be made the third highest ruler in the kingdom. So Belshazzar asks, I don't know, out of desperation maybe, but maybe also this air of haughtiness, like arrogant and superior. Are you Daniel, one of the exiles, one of the captives brought from Judah? one of the foreigners, and yet the king was willing to give even this Jewish exile who he didn't know the opportunity to read the writing on the wall and to receive what he had promised his own wise men. I have heard that the spirit of the gods is in you. Again, no acknowledgement of God himself, but these gods, lowercase g. It was ironic that Daniel, a worshiper of the god, Belshazzar had been dishonoring in this banquet might prove to be more wise and more helpful than the Babylonians themselves and their material gods. And Belshazzar's willingness to reward Daniel, a Jewish exile, shows how desperately he wanted to learn the meaning of the message on the wall. He was willing to clothe Daniel in purple, give him that luxurious gold chain, and make him the third highest ruler in the kingdom, just as he offered his own Babylonian wise men. He had exhausted all his options, and this scene demonstrates again that the wisdom of the world is not supreme and cannot fully understand the present or the future. Belshazzar was not willing to seek the wisdom of God until his own wisdom and that of those around him failed. And now he's willing to listen, but we'll see in a moment that it's too late because it's his ongoing sin and unbelief which started this crisis in the first place and now leads to his downfall. When do we seek wisdom from God and his word? Only when we're in crisis. Who or where else do we seek wisdom from? And is that wisdom in line with God's wisdom? I wonder if there are people in our lives that need to hear godly wisdom and how might God be trying to use us to convey that wisdom to them? Daniel responds here, verse 17, Then Daniel answered the king, You may keep your gifts for yourself and give your rewards to someone else. Nevertheless, I will read the writing for the king and tell him what it means. So he starts with reminding everyone about the lesson of humility God taught his forefather, Nebuchadnezzar. And there's all this anticipation. He just wants to hear what's on the wall, but he starts here by talking about Nebuchadnezzar for good reason. We read here, Your majesty, the most high God, gave your father Nebuchadnezzar sovereignty and greatness and glory and splendor. Because of the high position he gave him, all the nations and people, peoples of every language dreaded and feared him. Those the king wanted to put to death, he put to death. Those he wanted to spare, he spared. Those he wanted to promote, he promoted. And those he wanted to humble, he humbled. But when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven away from people and given the mind of an animal. He lived with the wild donkeys and ate grass like the ox, and his body was drenched with the dew of heaven until he acknowledged that the Most High God is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. Daniel reminds the people in the room You can see this photo here and imagine this grand banquet hall with a thousand people now eagerly listening about the incredible power and empire Nebuchadnezzar had where he could do whatever he wanted. He could take anything he wanted, have anything he wanted. He could decide whether people lived or were killed and elevate or promote or or demote those that he wanted. And although he had everything, he behaved in a way where he abused his power acting not reasonably, but with passion and impulse. God allows kingdoms to reign, and he gave Nebuchadnezzar that kingdom 
and the glory and the honor, but Nebuchadnezzar was prideful and his heart was hardened. It was, he was unimpressed by this God of the Jews, the God of Daniel, and more interested in commemorating himself, like with a large idol, and standing tall and proud of his achievements for Babylon. So God stripped him of his power and had him acting like an animal because of his arrogance and refusal to acknowledge who God is. The most high God who is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and sets over them anyone he wishes. Daniel had to talk about the past first in order to address the present because there are obvious parallels here. And now before Daniel reads Belshazzar, the writing on the wall, which would explain his doom and downfall, he points out that Belshazzar has not learned from his ancestor. He has not humbled himself, even though he knew what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. So Daniel points out Belshazzar's sin in verse 22. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself, though you knew all of this. Instead, you have set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives and your concubines, drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. So Daniel explains to Belshazzar that he has chosen to be against God, to blaspheme the name of the Lord as he and all of his officials drink from these goblets that did not belong to them. And they made them party cups, essentially. And instead, they praise gods who aren't even living and they're inanimate objects. And they prefer to worship these gods that they cannot see or hear or know everything. But you did not honor the God who holds in his hand your life and all your ways, is what it says here. Belshazzar's ultimate sin was in not recognizing who God is as our creator and ruler, the one who gives us every breath that we take. And all of humanity lives because of him, and we are called to know him, to devote ourselves to him, and to glorify him because God is transcendent over all since the very beginning. And so comes the fate of Belshazzar, finally with the writing on the wall. Daniel reads out for the people what it says. And this is the inscription that was written. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. And here is what these words mean. Mene, God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Paris, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. All of the words here refer to measures of weight, and it's spelled out pretty clearly, but we can look at each word in a bit more detail here. So mene can mean numbered or mina, which is a unit of money, so numbered. And it refers to the number of years God had planned for this Neo-Babylonian empire that is now coming to an end. The word is repeated probably to stress the certainty of this point, the finality that this kingdom is going to end now. Not only Belshazzar's reign was ending, but the time was up for the entire empire. Mene, mene. Tekel can mean weighed or shekel, which is um, currency. Here we can see it refers to weight. Belshazzar has been weighed on the scales of right and wrong, of justice, and found wanting. So not wanting as in we want something, but Wanting here means how we don't have something. We're lacking what is required or necessary. And so God weighed Belshazzar on his scale and found him deficient. He was not the ruler he should have been because he flat out refused to acknowledge God's sovereignty. He failed to measure up to God's standards of righteousness. And he was not loyal to God at all. Tekel. And then we have Paris here, which can mean divided or Persia. Uh, or again, some form of currency, half mina, half shekel. And here it means divided. Your kingdom is divided or broken into half and given to the Medes and the Persians. Mene, mene, tekel, parson. So God has numbered, he has weighed, and he divides. God set an expiry date for Babylon. He weighs out Belshazzar's loyalty, and he divides the kingdom into two. And so just as promised, in verse 29, then at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was clothed in purple, a gold chain was placed around the neck, and was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. And that very night, 
Belshazzar, king of the Babylonians, was slain, and Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. We have no record of what the conversation was after Daniel read what was on the wall. We might expect the king to want to execute Daniel for proclaiming his downfall. Uh, maybe he considered repenting, but he knew it was too late. Belshazzar honors Daniel as he said he would um, with the things that he promised if Daniel could read the writing. But unlike Nebuchadnezzar, we don't see any evidence here or any script saying that he comes to honor God. We know that the writing's already on the wall and Belshazzar's fate is set. So Belshazzar was actually the last king of Babylon, and that very night the empire was taken over. The Medes and the Persians were already pouring into the city as Daniel interpreted God's verdict against Babylon. And the fall of Babylon, just want to take an aside here, was very significant. Babylon is a name well known even today. The empire of Babylon, it was built very well and therefore had not been invaded for thousand years and it had a double wall system with a moat between the two walls the outer wall was miles long it was very thick and super high and i keep finding different numbers so i'm not going to say how high um, but it was very very high um, and many gates and hundreds um, more towers that reached above the wall so it was not an easy feat to invade babylon they would have seen enemies coming from so far away but this was the night of the festival, and maybe Belshazzar was confident in his security of the capital as he banqueted and, and drank, but the city was taken without significant resistance. I wonder why. Because of the writing on the wall and what God had decided would be the fate of Babylon. God judges Belshazzar's pride by taking the kingdom from him and giving it to other kingdoms. He divides it in half. And he can do that because he is the supreme ruler over all kingdoms. The Babylonian Empire had conquered Jerusalem, taken the people ca captive, looted the temple, and completely destroyed the city. And now God is saying, no, you don't get to do that to my people. You will not get away with this. So here is Daniel, to whom I will reveal your downfall. God will have the last word and reign supreme and establish his kingdom the way that he wants to. And what he declares over us will become true. As much as we think that we may have control and power in our human condition, the most high God is worthy of our praise because he is sovereign over all and his power is limitless. This is the God that we believe in. He is truly Lord over all and he knows the number of our days, and his ways are perfect. We learn here that God has power over all rulers on earth. When we compare Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar here, you can check out this infographic from the Bible Project. I got really into images this time. Um, we see God bring justice, humbling Nebuchadnezzar and restoring him on the throne when he acknowledges the authority of God. And then here he gives away Belshazzar's kingdom because he learned nothing from the example of Nebuchadnezzar and he blasphemes against God. There is no fear of the Lord. There is no reverence for God. And there's this pattern here that human beings and kingdoms can become violent when they glorify their own power and redefine what is right and wrong and don't acknowledge God. See the Russia-Ukraine war, dictator regimes, human trafficking, corporate crime, corruption, etc. We live in a world today where the mention of God can be so offensive to many people because people want to be God themselves and decide what is right and what is wrong because of pride, because of lust, because of greed. We want to put ourselves on the throne instead of God because of our sin. But there's this promise that one day God will confront the beasts, these violent empires, there will be no more kingdoms except God's. He will rescue his world and his people by bringing his kingdom, which he's already establishing. He will rule over his world and vindicate his suffering people. And there will come a day when we won't be in pain, we won't be lonely, we won't be persecuted, we won't be sad, and we won't experience injustice. Because even when the worst events begin to unfold, God is still on the throne. Despite what it looks like, despite what we may be going through, God is in control. Do we believe that? Have we accepted that? 
And furthermore, can we fully surrender all of us to him knowing this? This book, this story has a message of hope and it should motivate us to be faithful, to hang on and continue to be loyal and live out the calling God has for us, just like Daniel. God brought Daniel up to be a prominent leader in Babylon, to show that he alone reigns over every king and he will make himself known. And we know that he already has brought us a savior and transformed a cross into his throne. He made our sin his own. And despite what it looked like, he was still in control because he rose from the dead. And now he sits on the highest throne above every president, prime minister, army, power, in order to give us this hope that he will return to reign forever. Despite what it looks like in our world today, God is still in control, and it is God's kingdom that will remain after all the others have been overthrown. Because the Most High God has reigned ever since the world began, and he will continue to reign forever. And that is really good news. The good that we see is only a foretaste of the goodness that will come when God fully brings forth his own kingdom, creating a new heaven and earth. What is God's plan for you? Where and how is he using you to show others that he is God? To show yourself that this God that you hear about, that you believe in, that you pray to, that you listen for, that you trust in, is real and truly victorious over everything. And we are called to fear him and to have the utmost reverence for him, for he is the great I am. So as we live and work and exist in the Babylon of today, with its own institutions that demand our allegiance to politicians, influencers, idols, and gods, how are we being called to seek the well-being of the world while our allegiance is to somebody greater? To live in this tension between subverting the culture we live in and, and have loyalty to the Most High God. Perhaps instead of focusing on what we may have done for God lately, we first need to be honest with ourselves about whose side we are on. Where does your loyalty lie? We have some questions up here. Um, I'm not gonna go over them. There are questions I asked throughout, but for discussion, they'll be posted. And I wanna take some time now for us just to pray and to quiet our hearts and just to reflect, and I want to read um, a few verses from Psalm 139. Um, it says, Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. O oh, sovereign God, we just give to you all that we may be feeling, that we may be experiencing as we hear from your word today. Ruler over all kingdoms, may we submit to your wisdom that is greater than any other wisdom. Fill us with knowledge and understanding so that we might be able to serve you and this world. Keep us away from what does not please you in this worldly culture. Help us fix our eyes upon you. Most high God who gives us breath and holds our lives in your hands, renew and transform us. We want to be loyal to you, God, and cast away all other gods and idols in our lives, not elevating other people or things, but centering our lives around worshiping and glorifying you with all that we are. Be exalted high in the heavens, for you alone are worthy of our praise, Jesus. Amen.